For limits approaching finite values from last week, approaching some number, there was a threefold technique for calculating limits, evaluating them, trying logical analysis, and then trying algebra to simplify them. Evaluating is impossible now since infinity is not a number and can't be used in arithmetic. As an aside, please don't do this. Arithmetic with infinity is not valid. The infinity symbol should never show up as part of a calculation. I could talk about logical analysis and algebra, but there is a better approach. In order to get to that approach, which is the subject of this video, let me return to a concept I introduced last week, indeterminate forms. Indeterminate forms arose by asking what parts of a limit are doing in order to better understand the whole. Last week's examples were limits of fractions. Say I have the limit of x minus 3 over x cubed minus 27 as x approaches 3. The numerator here gets closer and closer to 0 as x approaches 3. Likewise, as x approaches 3, x cubed approaches 27, so the denominator also approaches 0. I label this an indeterminate form of type 0 over 0, since both numerator and denominator approach 0. Using last week's techniques, some algebra is necessary to approach this, since I can't directly understand what the behavior is. This week introduces some new indeterminate forms. This is a limit as x approaches infinity. The numerator, e to the x, is a growing function, getting larger and larger. So as x approaches infinity, e to the x also approaches infinity. The denominator, x squared plus 1, is the same. As x approaches infinity, x squared plus 1 also approaches infinity, that is, gets larger and larger without bound. This is an indeterminate form of type infinity over infinity. It also cannot be directly understood, since I can't make sense of the ratio when both are getting very large. There are a number of other possible indeterminate forms. If both f and g approach infinity, then the difference f minus g is also difficult to understand directly, leading to a form of type infinity minus infinity. With an exponent and a base, if the base approaches 0 and the exponent approaches 1, the behavior is unclear. And likewise, if the base approaches 1 and the exponent infinity, these are indeterminate forms of type 0 to the 1 and 1 to the infinity. Of great importance here, these expressions are labels, not calculations. Indeed, all of these are impossible labels, which is precisely the point. These are expressions that cannot be directly evaluated. They are indeterminate. I can't divide by zero. I can't do arithmetic with infinity. None of these are valid operations. But as labels, they are very useful to figure out what kind of limit I am dealing with and what techniques are needed. So, let me finally introduce the idea of this video. Take a limit, as x gets larger and larger without bound, of the ratio of functions. Assume this is of type infinity over infinity, that is, both f and g grow without bound. The ratio is what ask, asking what happens with f and, b, f and g relative to each other. That is, which function grows faster? To understand this limit, I need to understand the relative speed of growth of the two functions. The mathematical technique that does this is a technique called asymptotic analysis. The term here is a little bit misleading. I've defined vertical and horizontal asymptotes already. This asymptotic analysis is in the same mathematical vicinity. It's about the growth of functions, but it is not strictly about asymptotes or how to calculate them. Sorry for the confusion on this point, but it is the standard term. So, here's how asymptotic analysis works. If this limit is zero, that means that the denominator must be larger than the numerator. It must grow faster. By this observation, I say that g has a greater or higher asymptotic order than f. However, if the limit is infinity, then the numerator must be larger than the denominator, and the function f must grow faster. And in that case, I say that f has the greater or higher asymptotic order compared to g. And finally, if the limit is a finite non-zero number, that means that f exists in the same ratio to g, a ratio that is stable. And I say that f and g have the same asymptotic order. 
In this way, I create a rough scheme of how fast functions grow in relationship to each other by assigning all of them an asymptotic order. To apply this idea of asymptotic order to functions, I need a ranking of functions by their asymptotic order, an asymptotic ranking. Here is that ranking. The start of the ranking is a constant, a function which doesn't grow. Anything that grows has a higher ranking than a constant, obviously, and it makes sense to start here. Any bounded function also has the same ranking as a constant. Sine and cosine, for example, have the same asymptotic order as a constant because they are bounded. The slowest of the commonly used functions that do grow is the logarithm. And for the most part, I can think of the logarithm as the thing that grows slower than any other growth function. Faster than the logarithm are the roots, the square root, the cube root, the fourth root, etc. The higher the degree of the root, the slower it grows. So the square root has a higher asymptotic order than a cube root, and so on. All of these roots grow faster than any logarithm. After the roots are the polynomials. The linear function is the slowest of these, f of x equals x, and then the asymptotic order increases with the degree of the polynomial. The quadratic is of a higher asymptotic order than the linear function, the cubic of a higher order than the quadratic, and onward to higher degrees. The exponential grows faster than any polynomial, even a very high degree polynomial. Of the commonly used functions, the exponential has the fastest growth, the highest exponential order. And this is the rough skeleton of the ranking of functions. There are subtleties to fill in, but this is already useful for evaluating many limits. Now that I understand the rough ranking, I need to know how to assign asymptotic order to a complicated function. There are a few rules. First, multiplication by constants doesn't affect the asymptotic order. f of x and c times f of x have the same order. For this reason, asymptotic order is a coarse measure, because multiplying by a large constant will obviously give a larger function. Asymptotic order only cares about the very long-term growth. So this constant doesn't make a difference to the order. If there is a sum of pieces of a function, the asymptotic order is the order of the highest piece. So, for example, in e to the x plus x cubed plus x to the 7, there is an exponential piece and two polynomial pieces. The exponential piece has the higher order, so the order of the whole sum is the same as the order of e to the x. And this is where we start to see the great advantage in asymptotic order. It allows me to focus in on the fastest growing piece of the function and ignore all the other pieces. That's dealing with addition. Products are a bit different. If I multiply two functions that are both growing, they both have an asymptotic order greater than a constant, then the asymptotic order will increase. Therefore, the order of x times e to the x is greater than the order of e to the x, because I have multiplied by another growing function, in this case the linear function x. All right, I have this idea of asymptotic analysis and asymptotic order. How do I actually calculate infinite limits of ratios of functions? Well, I just need to determine the asymptotic order of the numerator and denominator. If the numerator has high, higher, higher order, the limit is infinity or negative infinity, depending on the sign of f and g. If g has a higher asymptotic order, then the limit is zero. If f and g have the same asymptotic order, then I look at the constants that are multiplied by the highest asymptotic order terms in both f and g. These are called the leading coefficients, and the limit will be the ratio of these leading coefficients. This is a very efficient algorithm for calculating limits. I just have to study the function and determine the asymptotic order. Often very little calculation is required. The answer to these limits is often given in sentences, stating the observation of the asymptotic order and making a conclusion. So let me do two examples. In both limits, the numerator and denominator are both polynomials. The asymptotic order is entirely determined by the degree of the polynomial. In the numerator here, the degree is four, but in the denominator, the degree is 5. The denominator has a higher asymptotic order, so the limit must be 0. That's all I need to do here. 
All the other terms, minus 14x plus 4, minus 30x cubed plus 4, they don't matter at all to this limit. Just the highest asymptotic order matters. In the second, the degree is 4 in both the numerator and the denominator. These have the same asymptotic order, so I need the leading coefficients, the constants in front of the largest asymptotic terms. In the numerator, this is 8, and in the denominator, this is 14. The limit is the ratio of these, 8 over 14, or 4 over 7. No other calculations are required, and again, the other numbers, the 3x squared plus 4 and the 9x cubed minus 50x squared minus 4x minus 1, don't affect the limit whatsoever. Where it applies, asymptotic analysis is a very efficient way to determine limits, with relatively little calculation and little complication.